Right. Well, hello all. Um, I am Megan Gimber um, and I work for People's Trust for Endangered Species, where I'm the key habitats officer. So my main focus is hedgerows um, and it's fair to say I am quite uh, hedge obsessed. Um, I grew up on a farm in Devon, um, although not, not a farmer myself. Um, and I helped lay my first hedge at the age of seven. Um, and even still, I would definitely not call myself um, a competent hedge layer yet. Um, so today's talk uh, is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour about hedges in general. So a bit about their value to wildlife, their value to landowners, a bit about their history, sort of some context, um, and then about their health and management. And then I think we'll probably have a quick break um, so we can have a cup of tea, glass of water, um, before moving on to how to go out and do some hedgerow surveying um, so we can understand sort of where our hedges are, um, how healthy they are and what we need to do to keep them that way. Um, I'm probably going to talk really fast so I can cram as much information in as I can. Um, if I'm talking too fast to be legible, just let me know in the chat box or, or flag me down and just say slow down a bit and I'm happy to. <laughs> Okay, so I will get started. So firstly, there's um, a bit of sad context. So as you'll all be aware, um, this is the State of Nature report um, from last year. Um, we're facing a bit of a double threat. Uh, we're facing a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis. Uh, and I wish I could sit here and tell you that hedges are going to fix um, both of these. Um, but I'm afraid they probably won't. Right. Um, but what I should be able to do is convince you that they're a really good place to start. Um, and we should definitely be considering them as part of our larger arsenal against both of these threats. Um, so as you know, 70% of the UK is agricultural land. So what we do within that is hugely important. And a further 12% of the UK um, is urban. And again, urban hedgerows have a really key part to play um, as well. So as a conservation charity, um, we're primarily interested in hedgerows for their value to wildlife. Um, and this value is enormous. Um, I like to use the example of dormice. I should probably have used the example of hedgehogs today, um, but I'll use the example of dormice. Um, they were one of the initial drivers for our hedgerow work. So we estimate we've lost about 51% of our dormice um, since the year 2000. They've gone extinct from 17 counties in the last 100 years, um, and it's fair to say they are in a fair bit of trouble. So as part of our dormouse conservation work, we do reintroductions to areas of the country where they have previously been lost. Um, and before we do this, we need to make sure that there's um, good connectivity uh, between these new populations and other dormouse populations. So this is really important as connectivity can help allow dormice to perhaps inhabit fragments of woodland that's otherwise too small to support a viable population. Um, they can allow gene flow between different woodland populations, um, which is very important. Um, and they can also uh, allow dormice to migrate to suitable new habitat as and where it becomes available. And sadly, the effect of climate change, especially on dormice who don't, don't even have waterproof fur, um, make the ability to relocate increasingly important. So dormice are arboreal creatures. They don't like scampering across the ground. They prefer to, to run through um, branches and trees. So it's actually hedges that provide the safest way for them to cross the countryside. Um, so incidentally, you know, um, hedges aren't actually their primary habitat. They, they, they normally live in coppice woodlands, but a hedgerow, a good hedgerow, is capable of su sustaining breeding populations of dormice. Um, but to do this, they need to be really healthy, they need to be big, and they need to be species rich. So dormice um, eat a variety of foods. This changes throughout the year. Um, they start off eating flowers, which is ridiculously cute. Um, then they move on to things like aphids, um, uh, and ash keys and uh, blackberries and hazelnuts throughout the year. So again, if, if we want to have them um, a breeding population in a hedge, a hedge really does need to be species rich to support them. Um, but what's really interesting and what's great about dormice is that if we get hedges right for them, uh, they are fussy little things, to be honest, um, we will have created a habitat that can actually support a really broad range of other species as well. Um, and of course, as you probably already know, we do a lot of work on hedgehogs as well. Um, and the, there's a clue in the name there that, that hedges and hedgehogs are intrinsically linked. Again, they absolutely um, love having that sort of linear um, connectivity. 
um, and the shelter that a good hedge can provide. So that's where we started with hedges, um, but it's fair to say our commitment extends beyond any of these individual species. Um, so why are hedgerows so great for wildlife? So as far as I see it, they provide three large roles and actually these are reflected in, in the way we do our surveying um, and the results that, that, that you get given from the Great British Hedgerow Survey. Um, so the first role is they provide a physical home. So this is things like nesting birds, hibernating hedgehogs, dormice, small mammals, insects like beetles, butterflies, all sorts. Um, there was a study done in, in um, Devon um, on just one 85 metre stretch of hedge uh, they counted 2,070 different species. And that was just one stretch of hedge, 85 metres in Devon. And the author, Robert Walton, um, who's part of Hedgelink and the Devon Hedge Group, um, says that he even thinks this is a vast estimate of the true number um, because he was only counting things you could see with a naked eye. Um, so 2,070 species in just one hedge, it's pretty mind boggling. Um, secondly, they are a really good complementary habitat. So this is one that's not necessarily home, but plays a really important role in life. So this could be for food, um, such as leaves, flowers, berries, insects, uh, or anything that might be hunting, small charismatic mammals, um, or it could be shelter from predators or shelter from the elements. So um, a good example, I think, is 84% of our farmland bird indicator species make use of hedges. Um, but actually, it's only 52% of them that this is their physical home. The rest use them as a complementary habitat. Um, and lastly, and importantly, they're used as wildlife corridors. So um, a bit like I was discussing with dormice, this is really important for all sorts, all sorts of creatures, um, hedgehogs, butterflies and moths um, actually really require the sort of the warmth and the shelter created by a hedge to allow them to get the body temperature to fly. Um, then we've got things like bats. Actually, bats are really interesting because um, they actually use a hedge for all three of these things. They, they will often uh, nest in hedgerow trees. Um, they will forage along a hedgerow because it's so full of insects. Um, and they'll always also use them as a, as a corridor because they, they tend to echolocate and use linear features in our countryside. So um, hedges are man-made um, and they're a man-managed habitat. So it does seem a little bit odd that they are so rich in wildlife. One of our, one of our richest habitats that we have. Um, but while they aren't like a natural habitat, um, in structure, they're what we call an ecotone, which is where you get more than one habitat overlapping where they, where they meet. Um, and a hedge kind of represents the, 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 the habitat that you find at a woodland edge um, and in this photo, this is a picture, one, one side is a hedge and the other side is a woodland edge. Um, and I took this photo and I really can't remember which side is which. So for hedges, um, we have overlapping elements of woodland, scrub and grassland. Um, and while it doesn't replicate any of the habitats fully, um, it does mean it's capable of supporting species from each of them, like 80% of what we would normally call woodland bird species. Um, and then for some species, actually having all of these overlapping elements um, is greater than the sum of its parts. So another good example, I would say, is the song thrush. So they will sing from the hedgerow trees, from the woody element. Um, they will nest in that sort of dense thicket of the hedge structure, the sort of scrubby element. Um, and they'll feed on snails and worms at the hedge base in that grassland pasture element um, before moving back to um, to, to the hedge berries later on in the year. Um, and actually, the closer you look at our native ecology, the more species you'll find that thrive in this sort of woodland edge ecotone. Um, why? I mean, it's, it seems a little bit strange. So I would say an alternative theory to the closed canopy theory, and now this is one we were all taught in schools. Um, we were taught that a squirrel used to be able to merrily hop from tree to tree, Land's end to John O'Grates. Um, but actually, an alternative idea to this is that the ancestral prehistoric state of this island was much more of a mosaic. So it did have woodland, but it had glades, it had areas kept open by herbivores, it had scattered trees, and it had a huge amount of scrub. 
Um, and all of this was in flux because it was all kept at different stages of succession by these moving herbivores. Um, and of course, things weren't neatly sectioned off as they are today. There's no sort of line that delineates a woodland from a pasture. Um, so really, there would be much more of this sort of woodland edge um, ecotone habitat. And if you think about it, if that's what our ecology adapted to, it, it sort of helps explain why those cultural habitats that mimic this structure, so hedges, wood pasture, traditional orchards, um, and all of these have that, that wonderful combination of open grown trees, scrub um, and, and grassland pastureland. Um, it helps explain why all of those are so rich in wildlife, despite being man-made habitats. So if anyone tells you that hedges aren't important because they're a human invention, just ignore them. So I thought we'd have a closer look at the structure of a good hedge. So a good hedge for wildlife um, has a diverse shrub layer. So hedges with more plant species have a higher diversity of invertebrates and birds. So partly this will be because each plant will have things that specialize on feeding on it. Um, but also it means you tend to get a better round, um, year round availability of food sources because they all flower and they all fruit at slightly different times. So the more, the more species you have in your hedge, the better for wildlife. Um, next up, the size. So generally, increasing the height and the width of a hedge increases both the diversity and the abundance of wildlife within it. So not only this, this isn't just because a bigger hedge provides more volume, um, but it actually also increases the complexity of the habitat. So you've got more niches and more opportunities for wildlife to live in it. So larger, more complex hedges uh, provide better shelter for foraging birds, uh, reduced predation for nesting birds. Um, so what I would say is that hedges should always be managed on a cycle, um, which will include cutting and will include rejuvenating. Um, but generally, increasing the average size of a hedge within that cycle is a really good idea. Um, Next up, we've got structural complexity. So some species like the thrush, as I mentioned earlier, need several hedge features throughout their life cycle. You can actually take this a step further um, uh, and look at landscape level as well. So given different species have different needs from a hedge, ideally we want to see many different hedge structures represented across the landscape at any one time. Um, and happily, this is one of the many benefits of man managing hedgerows on rotation. Um, next up, we've got good connectivity, which I mentioned for, with the, an example of the dormice. Um, and then we've got a margin at the base. So this is just really not only reducing the impact of compaction or um, soil disturbance at the base of a hedge, which can disturb the roots, um, but also provides a fantastic habitat in itself. So um, wildflowers and grasses uh, and having some uncut um, grass at the base of each hedge, maybe with some wildflowers in it, and um, provides a fantastic habitat. So this is this is where you'll get hedgehogs and um, feeding and nesting, and this is often where you'll get dormice nesting as well. Um, uh, so having that sort of uncut margin uh, just at the base of a hedge is really very important. And actually, vegetation at the base of a hedge is it is crucial as well. So, so one, of the, one of the reasons, one of the ways in which you can understand a hedge is a, in need of a bit of rejuvenation um, is when hedges start to get leggy. And when I, what, what I mean by leggy is it means you get the stalks at the bottom of the hedge where you don't have as much growth. Um, you can see in this photo that the vegetation of that hedge goes right the way down to the floor. Um, and that's so important for, for small mammal protection, bird protection, um, whilst they're foraging and nesting. So lastly, I would say in hedge structure, um, I will talk about trees um, and they are so important that I've given them a slide themselves. So over half of our priority species associated with hedges are dependent on hedgerow trees. So they do everything from providing song posts and territory markers for important bird behaviors, um, but also nesting opportunities for, for birds, bats and more. Um, in a year where you've cut a hedge, um, that hedge won't produce any flowers or fruits, but a hedge tree still will. So they're very important for food, even on hedge cutting years. 
Um, old hedge trees, so especially old pollard trees that you might find in ancient hedges, um, provide really valuable deadwood habitat. So um, we, we, know, we know making log piles is fantastic for deadwood invertebrates, but we've actually got a huge number of deadwood invertebrates that really require um, the very specific combination of dead and decaying wood within living trees. Um, and you get that with things like hedge pollard trees. So we've got about 2000 different saproxylic um, insects in this country. And we don't know that much about them, to be honest. But what we do know is that at least 320 are known pollinators. So we, we know that they are an important group. Um, but sadly, uh, as far as hedge trees go, we've lost a huge number of hedge trees. Um, firstly, to Dutch elm disease. Um, we're just about to lose even more to ash dieback, ash being one of our most common hedge trees at the moment. Um, and we know that we're not establishing enough new trees to accommodate these losses. So I don't know if you can see on the screen, but in the bottom left, um, there's two maps showing the same area. One is an old ordnance survey map, um, and beside it is the satellite imagery of what this land looks like now. So obviously there's a couple of hedges that are missing in there, um, but I think what is just as striking um, is the loss of mature hedgerow trees. And those are in the, in the far left um, map, those are those little dots that, that are marked on those boundaries. Those were individual mature hedgerow trees um, in, the, in the old OS maps. Um, and as you can see in the satellite image, almost none left there today. Um, so a huge decline in our hedge trees, which makes you think really, um, in a time like today, where tree planting is all the rage, like political points being scored all over the place for, for tree planting. Um, I would say that establishing trees in hedges seems like an absolute no brainer. It doesn't take any land out of production. You don't use any, any um, farmland. Um, they form open grown trees, which have enormous benefits to wildlife um, and, and live longer, store more carbon, all sorts of things than, than um, woodland trees. Uh, you know, you could, they can be managed if that's of interest to you. So they could be pollarded or, or coppiced, managed for wood fuel or, or additional crop. Lots of people are putting um, things like apple trees in hedges now um, as part of, um, as part of the, the uh, uh, crop production. Um, and then if, if, if there's things to worry about, so, you know, if you're worried about the impact of shading, um, either on crops or amenity land, then you can use small trees. So you can use small trees in east-west hedges, and that will reduce much shading impact. Um, and then if you've got uh, any north-south hedges, that's where you can put your big trees, things like beeches and oaks. Um, and there they don't, they don't have the impact on shading, um, but they do offer really good benefits of wind protection against prevailing winds. So hedge trees, I would say, um, could and should be established for free uh, through natural regeneration. So all you need to do is, is tag a suitable young candidate um, and spare them when it comes to trim time. Uh, the added benefit of this is you're preserving the genetic diversity present in your local tree populations, especially if your hedge is an old hedge. It also means no plastic spirals, no coppicing either side, no um, digging in or buying, buying extra, extra trees. Um, but, but coming back to this genetic diversity point, genetic diversity is, is crucial. It's, um, it's a crucial defence against any unknown threat of the future. So I, I like to use the example, uh, one oak tree may have genes um, that make it slightly better in drought conditions, while another may have a slightly different root structure um, that make it more able to tolerate floods. And a third oak tree may have some natural immunity or natural resistance to whatever new tree disease might be on the horizon because they all are quite variable. So certainly, you know, we, we don't know all of the threats that they're gonna face in the future. We know some of them um, and we know there are probably going to be more. Um, so preserving as much of this like historic genetic diversity as possible should be an absolute priority. Um, but of course, you know, you can also plant trees in hedges that don't have suitable trees coming up uh, and call me an optimist. Um, but whenever I see a gap in a hedge, like the one bottom bottom right in this screen, I just think it's a, a great opportunity just to plant a new hedgerow tree. Um, so all this, all this while, hedge trees are providing benefits to wildlife, 
they're storing carbon, cleaning our air, reducing flood potential, um, and I would say adding to the beauty of our landscape. Um, but of course, it's not just the structure of a hedge. Uh, the origin story of a hedge can have a big impact on its wildlife value as well. Not all hedges were born equal. Um, so some of the oldest hedges I know of are down in Cornwall, and they are estimated to be about 6,000 years old, which absolutely blows my mind. Um, they're stone-faced banked hedges, which are a wonderful new set of niches. Um, then, of course, we've got um, ancient uh, banked hedges of the West Country, like Devon and, and some in Wales and Dorset. Um, uh, then we've got things like uh, called Assart hedges. Now, these are... Um, they're hedges that were literally cut from the woodland, so the, the, they were left as a border uh, as the fields inside were cleared of the original wildwood. Um, and these Assart hedges are, are so very rich in diversity, um, reflecting that ancient diversity of, of the woodland from which they were cut. So you'll often find things like ancient woodland indicator plants in Assart hedges. And to be honest, that's not really surprising, um, given the fact that they are literally the remnant of ancient woodland. Um, so again, incredibly important habitats, both for their, their, um, their species diversity, but also the genetic diversity within in them as well. Um, and then of course, there are the enclosure hedges. Um, and these are the ones that we, that we know and love um, that were more common in the central part of the country. So um, they were planted when common land was hedged in and basically taken for the aristocracy. So we went through about 500 years of this um, and most of the hedges that were planted were single species hedges, um, about 200,000 miles of it. Um, so mostly hawthorn hedges planted in, uh, in straight lines. Um, and then of course we also have urban hedges. So urban hedges tend to have slightly different roles than agricultural hedges, um, so you'll often find different species present in them. Um, you'll often find more evergreen species in urban hedges um, uh, and, uh, and a few more non-native um, uh, plants in urban hedges. And again, you know, they, they, they sometimes have slightly different roles, things like um, uh, reducing um, air pollution, noise pollution, um, increasing privacy. Um, so they, 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 will, they will look slightly, slightly different. Um, but of course, you know, some hedges are in better shape than others. And it's the management that has a huge impact on their capacity to sustain wildlife um, and even their capacity to act as effective wildlife corridors. So I actually took this photo in Kent whilst I was te uh, testing one of our hedgerow surveys. Um, and the area was so poor uh, that I couldn't even get a long enough stretch of hedgerow to survey. Um, so this level of fragmentation obviously makes it nearly impossible for animals such as dormice or hedgehogs to use the hedge for any of their three main uses. So you, you've probably come across this stat. We went through some really dark decades uh, where hedgerows were grubbed up, um, actually incentivized by the government. So um, we can't just blame the farmers for this one. Um, and we lost up to about half of our hedges. Um, and you might see on this on this image, you can sort of see the shadows of them that sometimes in the countryside still, uh, where the soil quality is different. And actually, I've I've put up the the um, link to this website um, on this slide. It's a an absolutely fascinating website. Um, you you can view the map side by side as they're shown here, um, and you can choose whatever map you want on one side and have a satellite imagery on the other. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating, but I do warn you, it is, it is hugely addictive. Um, and luckily, this period of removal is generally behind us um, and in all over the countryside, I'm seeing new hedgerows being planted, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, but it is worth remembering that what we have now shouldn't be considered a baseline. Um, we should always consider the historic loss. Um, that hedges don't adequately, new hedges don't adequately replace the value of old ones and don't do for quite some time. Um, and that given the historic loss, it's really, it's more important than ever, really, that our remaining hedges um, are kept healthy. Uh, but sadly, we do still risk losing many of our hedges and largely this is through the way they're being managed. So the last countryside survey um, showed that only 31% of our hedges were in good condition 
with appropriately managed margins. And this dropped to just 10% in arable land. Um, sadly, urban areas weren't even, weren't even calculated. So it's, it's very difficult to get stats for that. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is um, a result of hedgerows no longer being managed according to their life cycle. Well, that's just going through some of the same stats. They're all very depressing, I'm afraid, so I'll skip over that. Um, and sadly, when you look at the trend in species that depends on our hedges, um, again, it doesn't paint a pretty, pretty picture. So this is um, the trend for our farmland bird indicator species um, from 1970 to 2019. Um, and remember that 84% of these species depend in hedges on some way or another. So similarly, we've lost about half of our dormice since 2000 and about the same in our rural hedgehog populations, although our urban hedgehog populations are now a little bit more stable. Um, and sadly, we are seeing similar declines across the board. Now, I can't say this is all down to hedges. We know it's not. There are several other factors contributing to these declines. Um, but given that all these species really do depend on healthy, well-managed hedgerows, making sure we provide these at least could be a well-needed lifeline for these species. Um, and even if you didn't give two hoots about wildlife, um, this decline isn't great, uh, partly because of all the additional things that we're missing out on. So I'm often told that hedges have lost their function as wire fences and walls are now cheaper and easier. Um, but this ignores all of the other practical and environmental benefits that hedges bring us. So I'm afraid this illustration is quite rural heavy. Um, I, haven't got, I haven't got a version for, for urban areas. Um, but an awful lot of the, the things that, are, that I will mention here um, are actually just as important in, in urban areas as well. Um, so I will, I will go through some of the sort of rural considerations because I think they're fascinating and, um, and, and important. So I will start with um, livestock. So hedges provide really valuable shelter um, and without shelter, uh, livestock have a higher mortality rate and they require more food, both of which are fairly expensive. So shelter increases lamb survival rates because it reduces um, hypothermia and wind chill. And then the shelter that hedge provides can extend between 12 and 16 times the height of a hedge. Um, and again, these stats are looking at livestock, but that shelter, that wind shelter um, is equally important in urban and amenity areas as well. Um, similarly, shade. So in the summer months, heat stress can take a huge toll on livestock. Um, so you'll often see cows and sheep crowding into the shady areas of a field. Um, and heat stress reduces milk yield, um, affects fertility, growth rates and immune function in dairy herds. Um, and similarly in amenity in urban areas, you know, on a hot sunny day, especially when we're getting these extreme heat waves, um, having hedges and having trees, especially trees in hedges, um, provide really fantastic shade and can help um, reduce local temperatures um, to more tolerable levels. Uh, next up, we've got diet diversity. So, you know, put a, put a herd of cows into a fresh pasture full of, uh, field full of pasture, and they will often still go straight to the hedge to, to eat what's in the hedge. Um, and actually this diverse browse is really great for them in general. Um, and if you've ever, you know, stopped by a hedge to pick some blackberries or slows for some nice slow gin, then you'll know that this, this benefit can extend to us too. Um, then we've got things like biosecurity. Um, so they can reduce animal to animal contact, which can reduce the spread of diseases. Um, but of course, if you're not interested in livestock, there are benefits to crops. So again, the windbreak can reduce damage, um, such as crop lodging, premature flower and fruit shedding, shoot damage, chilling injuries, etc. Um, they can also help us reduce our pesticide use. So the University of Reading have done some fantastic research on this, um, looking at the increased populations of beneficial insects, such as predatory spiders, ground beetles, parasitic wasps and hoverflies that can help control crop pests. Um, and then of course, um, they will support a diverse population of pollinators. So things like when our crops are in flower, that's only for a couple of weeks a year, um, things like our hedges uh, are there and are there really useful to support our pollinators through the rest of the year um, when our crops aren't in flower. Um, but actually what, what often gets overlooked is that they also provide an area of uncropped land that's essential for pollinator overwintering. 
so pollinators you know bees and um and, and and all the different types of pollinators that we've got they they won't they won't overwinter in cropped land they're in a in a plow field um they'll often need undisturbed soil or um hollow stems of of, of flowers or the trees or the you know, all the different micro habitats that a hedge can provide um Okay, so leaving farm, farming behind a little bit, um, other benefits of hedges, so they can help reduce soil erosion. Um, so again, they can do this in two ways. F firstly, by reducing wind speeds, um, but also acting as a barrier to waterborne runoff. Um, and they can also reduce the, the, um, the, the damage of flood. So the plant roots increase the rate at which water infiltrates into the soil. So this basically helps the soil act like a, a sponge to soak up flood water rather than allowing it to run off the surface. And again, I would say this is equally important in urban areas um, because there aren't that many areas um, to, to let the water really soak in. Um, and things like tree and hedgerow roots are much deeper than grass roots, um, and that allows like a larger and deeper area of that soil profile to act like a sponge. Um, and of course, you know, water is not the only thing they soak up. Um, they soak up air pollution. Now, some things do this better than other others, um, and I, and again, this is this is where um, uh, amenity and agricultural hedges sometimes differ in in species composition, um, and the, they can also soak up noise pollution um, uh, and reduce field runoff or, or, or surface runoff, um, helping stop a lot of pollution reaching our rivers. Um, but I think the thing that a lot of people are talking about, a really hot topic at the moment, is that they soak up carbon. So, you know, they've got obviously the, the, the woody stuff that you can see above ground. Um, but of course, they've also got the roots below ground. Um, and actually, they're also storing uh, carbon in the soil um, around the roots. And so it has soil organic carbon, which is a, a much more stable form of carbon um, if that soil isn't then disturbed. So their contribution to climate change is rapidly being recognised. So the IPCC recently recommended that we extend our hedges by 40%. Um, the Campaign for Rural England um, have come to a similar figure um, and have just launched a campaign um, 40, for 40 for 50 or 40 by 50, um, saying that we should be increasing them by 40% um, by 2050. Um, and the NFU um, have also highlighted how valuable hedges are going to be in hitting their target of net zero in the agricultural community by 2040. Um, so how do we increase carbon in hedges? I would say loads of ways. So just a few tweaks in management really can help establish uh, more hedgerow trees. Um, goodness knows we need more hedgerow trees anyway. Uh, filling hedge gaps um, and generally allowing hedges to be bigger on average um, all of those things could be doing way more for us before we've even got into the idea of planting more trees, more hedges. So we've, we've got sort of over 400,000 kilometres of hedged, hed, managed hedge um, and loads of them need more trees, loads of them need a bit more growth anyway. So hedges could be making a real contribution. So there's a, a bundle of other sort of benefits on here, things like privacy and then a, a whole load of less quantifiable um, but extremely important benefits such as sense of place, um, uh, sense of beauty, um, and our general well-being. Lots of studies have shown um, how, how plants and being around nature can help our general well-being. So hedges are, are I mean, they're a defining feature in, in our country. They've got really deep and significant cultural value, um, and they tell the story of, of our landscape over many centuries. So how do we manage for healthy hedges? Because healthy hedges basically um, make all of these all of these values better. Um, I'm going to guide you through some of the basic principles of hedge management before we get on to the, the, the um, survey. So how do we achieve healthy hedges and what does a perfect hedge look like? Is there a perfect hedge structure? So I would say there is no definitive answer to this question, sadly. Um, as I'd say, the more variation that we have in our hedge architecture, the better, because we need a mixture of shapes and sizes to suit all of our wildlife. Um, but what we do know is um, that 
the diversity of habitats within the hedgerow network supports more wildlife uh, and that hedges are ideally managed in a life cycle. So the reason when, when people ask me what's, you know, how big should my hedgerow be? And I'm like, well, at what point in its life cycle? Um, because there is no definite size, perfect sized hedge. Hedges should always be managed um, in a cycle. So they should always be changing. So the first step to hedgerow management is um, often comes as a surprise to a lot of people, uh, but hedges do require management. They need to be cut every now and again, otherwise they'll start to develop into a line of trees. Um, and while that doesn't sound like a bad thing, um, you know, we all, we all love trees. They all compete up for light. They lose that dense structure of the base, which is so valuable for wildlife. Um, and then they start to topple and they get gappy um, and eventually lost. So we've gathered that we hedges need to be cut, uh, but the devil is in the detail. How and how often they're cut makes all the difference. So when they're young, or, or particularly when they're recently rejuvenated, um, cutting a hedge fairly frequently can be a good thing when you're developing its structure. So by taking off the growing tips, um, you actually change the balance of the hormones within, within the plant, helping create that dense structure. So most of our hedging plants respond to the growing tips being cut off by putting more effort into branching growth, like a, I imagine it like a puffer fish, you sort of, um, and if you keep doing this, cutting slightly wider and slightly higher with each cut, you can actually create this wonderful, thick, dense structure that's really great shelter for nesting birds and mammals. Um, so once you've, once you've established this structure, how often should you cut then? Well, I would say most of our hedge plants um, blossom and fruit on second year wood. So hedges shouldn't be cut every year. Um, if you cut them every year, you cut off most of that, that fruiting potential. So the picture on the left is uh, a hedge covered in berries. Earlier in the year, it would have been equally covered in blossom. Uh, the image on the right, which I took just five minutes afterwards up the same track, um, is another hawthorn hedge that's trimmed every year. And as you can see, it's completely devoid of berries. Hold on, I'm just plugging in my laptop. Okay. Um, so what happens when you cut a hedge every year? Um, that often goes hand in hand with cutting it at the same height. And I think too many people fall into the trap of treating a hedge like a wall, like a green wall, and just thinking it can be cut back to the same height every, every single time. Um, this actually leads to something called chronic over trimming. Uh, so that not only reduces the value of the hedge to wildlife, um, but actually it really threatens the structure of the hedge as well. So it will start to lose density at the base. Um, and I can't, I can't stress enough how essential hedge base is for wildlife. Um, then eventually you'll start to lose stems. And at first they'll kind of stretch to fill those gaps. But the more you lose, the more difficult it is for them to do this. Um, so gaps start to form and then they extend if the management doesn't change. Um, so this video is a little bit depressing, I'm sorry, but um, it's a real problem for hedges and you, you kind of have to use your imagination and speed up time to really picture how this happens. So it's the, I've attempted to do that here. Um, look. This is the end, beautiful prayer. This is the end, my only friend. The end of our elaborate plan. The Sorry, that was quite a depressing watch, but luckily this is completely avo avoidable. Um, all you need to do is cut your hedge slightly higher and slightly wider every time you cut. It may just be, you know, five or ten centimetres, um, but it actually makes all the difference. So what you do when you, what, what you avoid when you do this is you avoid that structural damage. Um, repeated trimming at the same height will give you this sort of knuckle of scar tissue after a while. Um, uh, so cutting incrementally uh, avoids that. Uh, you also al always keep a border of young wood. So you've always got young wood that will flower and fruit even on years that you cut. 
Um, and actually, again, a bit like when you're creating the structure of a hedge in its in its early years, um, you're helping uh, ensure that you still have that sort of thick density to hedge um, because you're always, you know, cutting off the tips and encouraging encouraging branching growth. So I'm always get asked, well, but what what happens when it gets to a size and it's too big? You know, what do we do? And and you know, isn't that a problem? We don't want our hedges too big. Um, well, I would say if, you, if you're cutting your hedge every three years, which is what we recommend in agricultural settings, it'll take 30 years before it's a metre taller. Um, even if you're cutting a hedge every year, it will still get a decade before it gets one metre taller. So it really, it really isn't desperate. Um, and actually, you will have a much better hedge for wildlife um, treating them this way. Um, I actually, I, I, I often refer to this sort of management as cutting them green. So if you if you cut them and they're still green at the end of it, um, assuming you're cutting them earlier in the year, um, then you've done it right. So you're sort of easing off the point where it was trimmed last year. Um, and when it does get too big or when it gets to a point where, you know, it's, it's, it's outgrown its space, it's at this point that you can either put it into non-intervention um, or you can do something um, like rejuvenate your hedge. So I think that covers how often um, and how, um, when to cut a hedge. Now this is this 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 can be quite difficult. So lots of hedges are cut in September, and that means all of the nuts and the berries uh, get cut off. So you know hedges are supposedly wildlife's larder, um, helping everything fatten up in preparation for winter. I mean we've even got um, winter visitors like field fairs and red wings that come over specifically for the fruit in our hedges and our orchards and things. Um, so we suggest cutting in late winter if possible, so January or February. The, the reason I say wherever possible is that I'm aware if you're cutting with heavy machinery, um, cutting in January or February sometimes means the soil is, is too waterlogged to take heavy machinery on. Um, so that, that, that can be a compromise. Um, and lastly, with the hedge management, I would say no matter how well you manage your hedge, it will at some point need rejuvenation. So this could be laying or coppicing and it resets that hedge life cycle. So it thickens the hedge back up from the base. Um, and from here, you basically start the whole process again. So this photo shows a beautifully laid hedge. Um, so hedge laying is, is essentially where you cut the base of each stem almost all the way through, about 80% through to be precise. Um, and then you bend the stem over and bind it in place. So that's quite a crude description of a, of a very skilled job. Um, so I, I hope not too many hedge layers are listening. Um, but essentially that low cut encourages plentiful shoots coming from the base. It's a bit like when you coppice something, you get plenty of shoots come back up. And again, that, that thickens it up from the base. Um, but the, the, the pleacher um, uh, is the stem that you, that, you, that you cut down, that remains attached to the roots by that 20%. Um, and that sort of stays like a living bound fence, which is fantastic. So again, this, this process like resets the cycle of succession and allows a fresh start for a hedge. And it is amazing how quickly these bound back. Honestly, give, give them a year and you'll barely be able to see the, the, um, the sort of um, the structure of that laid hedge in there because it will be so thick with regrowth. Give it, give it three or four years and it will be the thickest, most beautiful hedge you will see. Um, and what I love about hedge laying is that when you think about it, every ancient hedge that we still have, those dating back hundreds and hundreds of years, we've got we've got hedges that we we still have that we've seen on maps 900 years ago. Um, so we know we've, we've probably got hedges that are older than that. Every single one of these ancient hedges is only still around because it's been hedge laid or coppiced, maybe once in a generation. Um, through through time. So there's an, essentially an unbroken chain of care and management and periodic rejuvenation. So this is what that looks like all put together. So this is the hedge management cycle. Um, it's based on the work of Nigel Adams from the um, National Hedge Laying um, Association. Um, and what it shows is that hedges are dynamic um, and they need to be managed dynamically based on their life cycle. So they're not just green walls and they can't be treated as such. It's not possible to keep the hedge at any of these points 
um, indefinitely, uh, otherwise they will start to decline. So some decline faster than others, and some so slowly that you would barely notice the change, but they will be declining. So it might look a bit complicated at first sight, um, but what I love about this diagram is all those arrows. So all those arrows show that basically no matter what stage your hedge is in its life cycle, there's a way to bringing it back into healthy condition. So in the center here, that's what we're aiming for, the, the green sort of circle and the bit up top, um, that's the healthy um, rotational cutting, incremental size increase, um, and crucially, um, uh, rejuvenation at the top there. And the problems with hedge management are represented on the two side flanks. So on the left hand side, you'll see a hedge that gets um, no management or minimum management, starts to grow tall, starts to lose density at the base, starts to turn into a line of trees. Um, and on the right hand side is what happens when you over trim a hedge. So when you try to keep it in that sort of wall box shape too long. And again, you lose density at the base, you get this hard knuckle um, at, the, at the trim line. Um, uh, you start to lose stems and it starts to become gappy. So these ones I'd say are actually um, more, of a, more of a priority to fix uh, because you know, not only are they disappearing slowly in front of us, but actually they're not really fulfilling any of the benefits that they could be doing in the meantime. So no benefits to wildlife, to the climate or, or to, to, to land managers. So those two side flanks in purple, those are what I mean when I talk about dropping out of the management cycle. Um, and none of this really is reinventing the wheel. I've just sort of put some pretty pictures to it really. Um, but this actually reflects how hedges always were managed. Um, so this quote at the top says, take a sharp hatchet or handbill and cut the steps in a plain place nigh into the earth and more than half asunder and bend it down towards the earth and wrap and wind them together. And it shall need no more mending for many years after. So that was written in 1573. Um, and what I love about that is that um, it, the process hasn't changed at all. It wasn't new in 1573. That's just, you know, the first time it was written down. So back when hedges were, were, were trimmed by hand at the top there, we've got a hedge that's been laid. Um, and then some periods of time, you know, you'd, go, you'd lay the hedge and just let it grow, lay it, let it grow. Um, and sometimes there was also trimming. So the photo on the right is of a land girl and she has got a hedge slasher, which is essentially like a bill hook on a big stick. Um, uh, and they would they would trim the hedge or, or slash slash them up um, every year. And again, it created that density of hedge that's really good for stock proofing. Um, but it also extends the period at which you can leave a hedge before you have to relay it, which is very, very useful. Um, but of course, you know, for, for, for ages, it was done with hand tools like a slasher. Um, and if you've got a, a whole stretch of year wood, the stuff that grew at the very early bits of the year would already be woody and tough. So if you're using a hand slasher to slash the hedge up, you'd actually inevitably not go through all of the year's growth. Um, and that meant the hedge got slightly wider and slightly taller every time they got cut. Um, so that's really where the incremental increase of hedges um, came from. And really, you know, as a bit of context as to why hedges have declined, um, I would say we basically seen a lot of changes uh, to the way we manage hedges. Um, and, and most of them have, have caused us to drop out of that management cycle. Uh, and really it just happened because we got better machinery. We got tools that made it easy to cut a hedge right back to the same height and width year after year. And that had never really been the case before. Um, and so while a hedge can cope with this for a while, uh, we are now seeing the impacts of what this does to hedge structure if it continues in the long term. So they can, they can cope with it for a little while, but they get to a certain, the plants, individual plants get to a, a certain point of maturity and then they start to not be able to cope with that management anymore. So we now have the opportunity, I'm not saying we should <laughs> return to hand tools, um, we have the opportunity to combine traditional methods with new insights and modern tools. We don't have to go back to hand tools. We don't have enough labor for that, let's be honest. Um, but actually we could just tweak the way that we use the tools that we have. So again, even just cutting higher and wider at each cut makes a really big difference. 
Um, and then there are lots of clues that hedges give us um, if we learn to speak their language. So, um, you know, when they're in need of a change of management, you know, there's a lot of clues that they will give us. So I've, I've put a few up here in the images. So top right, we've got the knuckle at the trim line. So Hazel does this particularly well. Both of these pictures of Hazel forms that scar tissue. Um, other plants will still have a knuckle, but it will look slightly different. Um, it will be just a thick, dense mat of growth that only comes from that trim line. Um, then next to it, we've got another hazel hedge. Hazels are very vocal at, at telling us when they need a, a new change in management. Um, I've called it sticky. Um, and it's essentially when, when the old stems of a hazel uh, sort of self coppice and, and fall off, um, that's when you really need to start be uh, uh, thinking about rejuvenating the hedge because all of the regrowth that will come from the base, um, because hazel is a, is a great hedge plant, but um, the, the regrowth will come from the base and it will just grow straight up like little bean poles until the height that it gets cut and you end up with a hedge just made of straight vertical sort of walking sticks um, as, I've, as I've shown here. Um, then in, in the middle lane, you've got low stem density, um, you've got high base canopy too, and, and these two combined actually um, really show that hedges are in need of rejuvenation. Ideally, you'd lay a hedge before it gets to these stages because you've already lost quite a lot of density there. Um, elder hummocks. So elder is a plant that's fantastic for wildlife, um, but it can cause a few problems in hedges. So they have a nasty habit of finding a crack in a hedge, especially when they start to thin at the base. Um, and they're such a fast growing species that they basically elbow that crack into a gap. Um, and of course they don't live hugely long. So then they just go and die and cre just create a gap in the hedge. Um, so again, you know, they're a fantastic plant for wildlife, but um, I would say use them as an indicator um, that a hedge might need some rejuvenation because it's obviously getting thin at the base. Um, and I call them hummocks because, again, they, they're such a fast growing species that even when you've trimmed a hedge perfectly flat, very soon you'll have like little bumps of elder as it's sort of out, outgrown the rest of it. Um, and then down at the bottom, we've got gaps forming. So we've got, I've got an over, over trimmed and an overgrown hedge there, both showing how gaps form um, when, when they fall out of the cycle. And ivy at the trim line, which has a bad habit of overshading the, the centre of a hedge, um, hollowing that hedge out because it's a, a shade tolerant plant and it has this habit of forming a wall when you cut that hedge to the same point each time. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, I'd say if you own or manage a hedge, go and have a look at them, um, especially, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks when the leaves start coming off, have a look at the structure. If, if your hedge is getting top heavy, and you've got more density at the top than at the bottom, um, then maybe think about, you know, altering some of the management that you, that you give to it. Um, I'd say we've got an app that helps with that. It's a free app that we've created for this project um, and it will help you sort of um, with your management decisions. Um, it's just six questions and it'll tell you, you know, where your hedge is in, in its life cycle. Um, but also I'd say if you've created a really good hedge, show it off. I mean, I'm, I'm on Twitter and I absolutely love that I'm, if I'm having a bad day, there are half a dozen farmers that will regularly sh share me pictures of brilliant hedges and it always perks me up. Um, and I think sh showing off good hedges is way better than um, criticising people for poor hedges, is, is my personal opinion. Um, hedges are, you know, the most visible aspect of the way we manage our land, I would say, one of them. Um, but our pride doesn't need to come from their neatness. Instead, we can boast about the flowers or the berries or, you know, how much carbon they're soaking in or all of the other things that they're doing for us. Um, if you don't um, manage or own any hedges, there's loads of things that you can do to help. I would say surveying is, is the key one. I would say that, but it's, it's very, very useful for us. So it gives us... Um, fantastic data that we can use to help guide our future conservation. Um, but again, it also provides management advice um, and health feedback, um, which can help um, help restore hedges. Um, another thing you could do is tag young hedge trees to encourage new hedge trees. Um, uh, speak to your local council or whoever's managing your hedges locally. 
Um, again, I spoke to another amazing individual recently who wrote to their council and said, could they update their hedge cutting regime in light of the climate and wildlife crisis? Um, and now they're coming together to, to, to put in a dynamic plan um, in place for all of the locally managed council hedges. So amazingly, you'll be surprised how many councils still get complaints um, about how tidy people want hedges. And if they don't cut their hedges, they, they'll get complaints. Similar, similar with them, uh, unmown verges. Um, and I think we need to balance this narrative. Just because one or two people don't like the sight of a slightly outgrown hedge, um, they're, they're often the ones that are, are, are more vocal. So I think, you know, if, if those are the only voices that our councils are hearing, they might be the only voices that they, that they react on. Um, lastly, I'd say um, maybe if you have space, create a community nursery. So if you do need to do any hedge gapping up or planting new hedgerow trees, I would say if you can grow those yourself, so much the better. Um, try to grow from slightly older stock. Um, anything from about 1990 um, has possibly been uh, imported from Eastern Europe. Um, and while that's that's OK, they, they tend to flower and fruit at slightly different times and they have slightly different characteristics and they're actually not quite so good for our native ecology. Um, and lastly, I'd say go out and appreciate all your hedges. Um, have a look, have a, just a closer look at them and, and really sort of get to know them. So understand the sort of the plants, the insects, the birds um, and everything that's in them, because I, I, I can guarantee that when you get a greater appreciation for hedges, you'll find yourself coming up with ways, you know, new and imaginative ways of helping. So what are we doing to help? Well, um, I'll rush through this because I realise I'm, I'm, I've been speaking for far too long. Um, we, we've got our two surveys, which um, I'll get onto in a bit. Um, and both of them collect information for us. So as the adage goes, you can't improve what you don't measure. Understanding how healthy they are is critical to help us understand what we can do both now and in the future to help them out. So it, you know, it directs all of our conservation effort, our messaging and the policy that we seek to change. Um, we do quite a lot of landowner communication. Um, I, I have quite a lot of time spent talking to directly to farmers and other groups that manage hedges across the country. So leaflets, talks, farm walks, um, all sorts. Um, partnerships. So we're working in partnership with a lot of fantastic um, organisations at the moment um, on a project called Close the Gap. So the Tree Council, the University of Reading, More Trees, Farm Wildlife Advisory Group and Hedgelink, we're all coming together with the common goal of, of um, helping our hedges. Um, and again, um, more, more collaborative working, we all chip in to this group called Hedgelink, which is uh, an, another partnership that brings together everyone interested in hedges to, to share knowledge and ideas um, and to work on projects as well. Um, so this can include research or sharing information um, or looking at policy. So there's an awful lot of policy at the moment that's coming up that will affect hedgerows nationally. Um, so we're checking, checking through all of that and giving um, uh, policy advice. So this is just a timeline that I created um, about hedgerows. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've been with us at some form since the Bronze Age and they've weathered some pretty turbulent times since then. So, you know, last century, um, wasn't the first time that politics had a big impact on our hedges. We've seen land enclosures, we've seen riots, we've seen uprising all over the humble hedge. Um, the history of hedges is actually really very fascinating, almost as fascinating as its wildlife. Uh, but recognising the whole host of benefits that they bring us um, means that there, there really is a growing interest in hedges at the moment, making sure that they thrive um, as well as planting new ones. So we would, I would say we've got a lot to thank farmers for in particular when it comes to hedges. You know, hedges are a man-made, man-managed habitat um, and it's centuries of farming and management that's led to this wonderful network that we see today. Um, and again, I think it's just amazing to realise that some of these hedges have been there for this, you know, this many hundreds of years, just thanks to an unbroken chain of care. You know, each hedge has been carefully laid perhaps once or twice in a generation through the many centuries. Um, and essentially it's that management that makes them immortal. Um, and again, it's skills passed from, from generation to generation, um, hedge layer to hedge layer, farmer to farmer. And they will only 
they will only survive if we offer them similar care uh, going forward. So when we get to this, this blue section at the bottom, bottom left of this poster, this represents the unknown future. So, you know, we, we understand quite a lot about their history, um, but, you know, the privilege of caring for them um, and the responsibility, I'd say, of ensuring that they've got a healthy future now falls to us. Um, so we're the generation that writes the next chapter in, in this history book. Um, so I am doing all in my power to make sure it's a good one. Thank you. Fantastic, Megan. Thank you so much. I know we've got a short break before the second session, but are we all right to just take some questions if that's okay? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Lovely. So um, over to the over to the teams. If you've got any questions, I've noticed Alex has joined us. Hi, Alex, over from Lincoln. So some of our teams do have rural satellite sites. Some of them are slightly more urban. There's a bit of a mix. Um, so there may be questions relating to hedgerows mm -hmm. or hedges. Um, but yeah, over over to you guys. If you just want to hit unmute, if you've got any questions or if you'd rather pop them in the chat box, that's absolutely fine. Hello. <laughs> I thought I'd pop in. I'm sorry that I was a couple of minutes late. I just wanted to say thank you for such an informative presentation, Megan, so far. Um, it's coming from a point of view of somebody. So our, our campuses, we have three uh, campuses, one um, urban, one ru really rural um, with farming land, etc. And then one um, that's a bit more of a satellite campus, which is very small. Um, but we are putting together a hedgerow management plan. Um, so that's something that, yeah, exciting. So this for me has been really informative because <laughs> I feel like I've come in from like no knowledge um, at all and I want to be able to benefit wildlife. And um, when we know we've got hedgehogs, we know we've got different types of yellow hammers and field fairs and stuff. We know we've got those on site. So it's um, quite important. So I just want to say thank you really. Um, so far. Oh, well, that sounds brilliant. Thank you. I mean, it sounds like you've already got fantastic wildlife in your hedges. Um, yeah. And coming up with a hedge management plan, it, that's music to my ears. <laughs> yeah. I, I was interested about the trees, to be honest, like the hedgerow trees, like that's the first time. So now that I know I can tag some um, with everybody, it'll be really, really positive. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, I, I would say keep an eye out from, for the tree council. Yeah. They've got um, some plans in the works. I'm not, supposed, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be releasing this or not yet, but we've, we're planning to, um, they've got some tree tags that they've developed and it's oh, from re recycled materials from old ship sails um <laughs> so they're brightly colorful um and i think they think they'll be they'll be developed and, and sent off quite soon so keep an eye out um on the tree council website because that might help um mm -hmm. but anything colorful really to tag suitable specimens and i know one chap who i met on twitter actually um and he is doing just that he, he realized that all of the hedge trees in his area were really old um and this this is quite common you look at all the hedge trees and you go they were all established before the flail became popular <laughs> um, because the flail just sort of chops everything off at the top and, and things, things don't really have much chance of, of growing through it. Um, so he spoke to his local um, farmer down the pub and said, look, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. All of these trees are getting old. You know, at some point they're going to fall over and there's going to be nothing to replace them. Um, and the farmer agreed and just said, do you know what, we can probably work together. So this chap is now going around his village and he's um, he's not using tags. He, he painted some some bean poles. So he got some bean poles and painted them bright colours. And now he's sort of shoving them in hedges where he sees a, a good candidate. And the farmer has instructed his contractor to sort of trim around them, basically. So and there, there are people out there doing it already and, and it works. And I just think it's a, a very elegant, elegant solution. Amazing. We'll definitely be colour colouring our trees, I think. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Alex. Any other questions from uh, anybody else in the background there, either on the chat box or if you want to unmute? Can I ask a question? It's Pam from um, Hadlow College in Kent. Uh, um, we're thinking of setting up a, well, it wasn't, we weren't going to call it a community nursery, but certainly a tree nursery in the, the college um, campus which we were hoping to grow trees from seed that we collected from the many trees on our site and maybe involve the local schools and do sort of sponsored trees or planting trees for the community so it kind of could extend into a community tree nursery uh, but that's just we've just literally started talking about it we've had the idea for a while are there any um, examples where that's already taken place do you know of yes. any campuses um, I don't know. I don't know whether they're on campuses, 
um, but I know of several community nurseries of varying scales. So there's one that we're working with down in Devon called More Trees, and it's actually commercial. It's, it's a non, non-profit, but it's a commercial nursery. So that might be at the slight higher end of the scale. Um, but I know all sorts down to, you know, village schools that are doing it, village um, parishes that are doing it. I've got two... <laughs> I've got two um, community nurseries myself, uh, which is, they're tiny. I mean, one of them is literally a bathtub, um, but it's surprising how many whips you can grow in a bathtub. Um, yeah. And again, you're never, you're never going to be able to, to plant a hedge with, with, it, with what you grow, but you will be able to fill gaps in. You will be able to create hedgerow trees. Um, and actually doing that can take some of the pressure off our tree nurseries, because at the moment, um, there's huge government plans for planting here, there and everywhere both woodlands and, and hedges and there aren't there aren't the nursery stock so we don't we don't you know nurseries have already run out for this season um and it's really difficult to sometimes get that stock so if if for things like gapping up and planting the occasional hedgerow tree if we can take the pressure off them so much the better it also means we're again keeping that wonderful genetic diversity um in the local exactly. area i would say definitely go for older specimens that you're collecting seed from so if okay. you're collecting from anything i, I I think there was a stat saying 80% of, I think it was about 80% of, of um, our hedging material from 1990 onwards um, came from Eastern Europe. Um, so again, you know, while there's nothing wrong with Eastern European plants, um, they, they do have slightly different timings to ours. Um, sometimes apparently our birds find the berries unpalatable. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of sort of subtle differences that you might not, might not know. Um, notice, like that insects do. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering whether there's a research project in that because we get a lot of migrant birds from Eastern Europe, don't we? We do, yeah, yeah. That, yeah I mean, it would be really interesting to find out actually. But then yeah. again, I think I think a lot of that changes from year to year as well because sometimes I see the hawthorn berries go before the holly, and sometimes I see the holly go before the hawthorn. Um, and I wonder if there's some old wives' tales in that that, that might have some truth. I'm not sure. <laughs> No, that sounds interesting. Yeah, but I would say definitely, definitely go for it. For it. There's, um, I can, if, if you're interested to speak to people that are doing nurseries already, um, I can link you up with a couple in Dorset. There's a, a few in, in Wales, but actually more trees, the, 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 the um, non-profit commercial one down in Devon, they're actually another organisation that's part of Close the Gap, um, and they will be providing advice about how to, set one up yourself what you need to think about how, how you can do it um, and basically a whole sort of kit of really interesting um, and useful information on it so I, I would say speak to more trees to begin with because they are they are certainly the experts do we need to join this close the gap or how can we join it or take no part it's or? um so it's it's a it's a government funded um project it's part of the green recovery challenge fund um, so it's just a, collect a collection of organisations that, that are working together. Um, but the the more trees um, stuff will be coming out, I think, early next year. I think. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> uh, but they will be available. So if you if you follow them on social media or, or have a look at their website, you might be able to to register interest um, or even just speak to them. They're a fantastic bunch. So they'll they'll, they'll be Thank pleased you. to give advice. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question, Pam. Um, yeah, it's interesting you asked that. I was going to ask how our teams might get involved in Close the Gap, um, and uh, that's yeah, very well explained. I think, Pam, if anybody else on the chat has any experience in setting up community nurseries on campus or in the local area, then maybe, Pam, you could pop your email into the chat or something, um, or we might maybe get a chat to go in after, uh, over, over email chain. We've got a question on the chat box for you, Megan, if that's all right. Um, how long have we got before, um, how long have we got for the second part of the session? Are we all right for a, a, one more question? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Lovely. So this is um, a question from the Fitzwilliam team. What happens to the pollution absorbed in the, into the hedges? Is it passed on to mammals and creatures eating the berries or is it kind of neutralised? Do you know what, I actually, I don't know the answer to that. I, I really should do, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know, so a lot of the, a lot of the agricultural pollution gets, um, uh, well, agriculture, things like fertilizer and stuff get, gets absorbed um, and utilized by by agricultural hedges. In terms of urban hedges, um, I'm not actually sure what happens to that pollution. I know I know it sort of quite quite quickly takes it out of the air, um, especially roadside hedges. 
like of particular heights, um, but I'm not quite sure what happens to it after that. That's probably something I should look into. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe um, and the potential for a research project. Yeah, it's quite. Um, and I know yeah. some plants are better for it than others. So um, there's there's like the small leaved rosaceae are really good, especially the ones that have those sort of sticky glands on the undersides. Um, uh, and and th anything, of course, that that is slightly more evergreen or, or holds its holds its um, leaves for longer. Uh, some of our native plants hold their leaves for longer as well. So uh, things like beech and oak, although they normally shed their leaves if they're actually trimmed into a hedge structure will often sort of hold their leaves over winter so that can help as well um great fascinating yeah i know there are certain species that can hold those kinds of toxins internally in their in the, just the cells of the of the plant mm. aren't they so um yeah that'd be interesting and uh, maybe we can um we can look up the answer see if there is an answer to that if not maybe we can get a student doing some research thank you pam popping your email address into the chat box so that's um uh, for anybody that might have experience setting up community nurseries um pam's looking for some advice there right so megan i think we're all right to take a break um now is that right yeah and absolutely roughly how long do you need for uh, your second session uh how long will people like five minutes ten minutes enough time to make a cup of tea 10 minutes sound all right everybody we've got till half past half past two for the session so that's when we're ending so um 10 minutes sound all right yeah lovely back in 10. <laughs> okay brilliant thank you very much i will try and keep part two let's see if i've got the right one um just share my screen again um, I will try and keep part two quite brief because I think I went a little bit over time with the last one. Um, but what I'll say is, you know, essentially um, we got better legislation that's made it illegal to remove hedges without planning permission. Um, but we are still at risk of losing many of them across the country through the way that they're being management, uh, managed. And unfortunately, there's, there's no legislation to stop the degradation um, of hedges through, through repeated um, flailing or, or mismanagement. So that's why things like surveying is really important. So we've actually created two different surveys. Um, one of them is our Great British Hedgerow Survey. So this survey is aimed at volunteer groups, wildlife groups, parish groups, etc. Um, it's fairly detailed. I don't know if any of you have come across the DEFRA survey, um, but it's based on that, but much streamlined. So this is just two sides of A4. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to do per hedge. Um, it needs to be done when hedges have leaves on them, um, as, as it counts species, um, and it provides us really high quality data about the hedgerow health. So this data at the national level, again, helps us direct our conservation messaging um, and, and work. Um, we then, you know, as soon as, as soon as these, the data is added to the survey website, um, each one gets immediate feedback tailored to the hedge that you've just surveyed um, about the health of the hedge, um, but also a blow for blow account of everywhere your hedge might have lost points and what you can do about it. Um, but it also ties it to the management cycle um, and offers advice uh, and management options based, based on that cycle. Um, and then the second survey that we have is called Healthy Hedgerows. So this is a free rapid assessment hedge management app. So it's designed for farmers and land managers um, and it's designed to be just a rapid version of the survey so it's just six simple questions about the structure um, the height the width the gaps the base canopy and the trees um, and again it it works out where each hedge is in the life cycle and sort of um uh, uh, and and gives management options based on that so you know it might be easy to apply the hedge life cycle to one or two hedges uh, but to do it across a whole campus, a whole farm, a whole catchment area or similar um, is more difficult. So that's where, you know, we built in simplicity into this app. So um, it doesn't give us such brilliant feedback in terms of data, um, but what it does um, is, is give information quickly and rapidly to, to hedge managers. Um, so this was developed as part of Close the Gap. Um, which is yeah, a green recovery challenge fund project. It's completely free to download and free to use, and it always will be. Um, the fact that it's an app, I think makes it slightly easier to use. Um, 
it can be done at any time of year. And actually what I'd say is this rapid assessment one is best done in winter because it doesn't count any species. So you don't need leaves on. Um, and actually it's in winter where you can see the bones of a hedge. You can see the structure. You can see whether it's getting top heavy or, or hollowing at the base. Um, and you can see a little bit more um, uh, that where, where it's starting to thin. Um, so that's the different, the two different surveys. One, one, one is a little bit more complete. Um, the other is much more of a rapid assessment if you've got multiple hedges to do. So I'll start off with uh, going through a little bit more detail of the Great British Hedgerow Survey. Um, so, as I said, based on the DEFRA survey, but slimmed down massively. So that was seven pages of what occasionally felt like passport application, um, but was very well thought through. The survey itself was um, incredibly well designed. So we slimmed that down. Um, but essentially kept what, what, what made that, that um, survey so good. Um, I'll click over this one. So there, that, that's the version that, that it was when it was created by Defra and Hedgelink. Um, and this two pager, this two pager um, is what the Great British Hedgerow Survey looks like now. Um, so the, the, the structure of these surveys is that you you do um, hedge by hedge? You'll the the the, the box in green on the first page um, is elements that you're looking at the whole hedge, um, and the box in blue on the first page is is um, a 30 meter sample. So you just choose 30 meters of the hedge and do a bit of a sample of that. Um, and then the second page of the survey is all about the species that are in that hedge. So there's a, a list of species here. Um, and you basically tick which ones are in there. Um, and then the second column, you're um, giving an indication about the, the, um, the spread. So for the five most populous um, species in the hedge, you're giving a sort of a vague idea um, uh, about how much of that hedge structure they make up. Um, and then the last columns there are looking at hedgerow trees across the whole of the hedge again. So again, we use the hedgerow cycle um, and we tie it in by, by choosing one of these structures that, um, uh, that, that matches the hedge. So certainly when you go out surveying, it's worth taking a print out of these with the descriptions because this, this is often um, the key part that ties it to the hedge management cycle that, that Nigel Adams made. Um, um, and actually, you know, this, the, the work of Nigel Adams has been absolutely pivotal to, to, to our understanding of, of hedge cycles. Um, it's remarkable you know, how, how it can completely change our understanding of hedgerow management um, and, and looking at the hedges around us. So when you plug all of this into um, the website, it gives you a, a score at the top. This, this screen might be a bit difficult to see, but the score at the top is a sort of an overall score. Um, and then there's sort of broad brush management advice below it. Um, and then there's three sections. So you get a separate score for biodiversity, structure um, and oh, I've got them in the, in the wrong order and connectivity and essentially th those are mimicking the um the three the three uses of a hedge that, that we spoke about earlier so the use as a habitat um, um as a complementary habitat and as wildlife corridor so we tally these in different ways so the connectivity we look at hedge gaps um but we also look at the number of connections so how well that hedge connects up the landscape for the hedge wildlife, again, we look at the number of species because that, that um, has an impact on, on you know, the, the number of, uh, of insects and birds that it can um, hold. We look at, we've got the thing called a food list. Now, of course, all of these species are going to be food for some things, but some of our hedgerow plants, you know, really, really pull their weight in terms of um, feeding a, a load of general species, um, hawthorn being one of them. We look at hedgerow trees again because I showed you how, how truly valuable hedgerow trees are. We look at the ground flora. So this one often gets questions. So we don't actually look at that many species, um, herbaceous species in this um, survey. The only ones we ask you to, to really record are cleavers, docks um, and nettles. And we look at the prevalence of them at the base of the hedge. Um, and this isn't because we don't like cleavers, docks and nettles. They're all fantastic plants for wildlife. Um, but actually what they do um, is they, they give us an indication about the levels of nutrient enrichment 
um, that are likely in that hedge. And of course, you know, um, nutrient enrichment, enrichment it makes soils less likely to support a diverse wildflower layer. So there's a number of reasons for that. So wildflowers, some of them can't tolerate higher nutrient levels. Um, some of them will lose their fungal root associations when you add too many nutrients. Um, and then some of them will just be shaded out by the presence of things like nettles and docks and cleavers, which can be big, bulky things that can smother other, other wildflowers. So as I said, there's nothing wrong with nettles, docks or cleavers, um, but the abundance at the base of a hedge can be a warning to us um, and we use them as a proxy for nutrient enrichment. For the structure, we look at the height and the width. We look at the base canopy and this is, the base canopy is, um, is another one to get your eye into. Um, this is basically where the leafy, woody material starts from at the base of a hedge. So again, we'd like that hedge material to go all the way down to the floor. Um, but for lots of reasons, sometimes it do doesn't. So if a hedge is over trimmed, um, it will start losing, losing um, growth at the bottom and just stick all of its new growth at the top. Um, if it's overstood, then it can be shading out the base. Um, sometimes if you've got a new hedge and you put spirals on, um, that will take out a good sort of foot, sometimes a foot and a half um, of growth at the very base. Uh, and that leaves the base of these hedges hollow. And again, things like hedgehogs in particular, um, ground nesting birds and anything that uses this as um, protection against predators really need that, that, that vegetation all the way to the base. So as soon as we have what I call a high base canopy, um, we know we need to do a little bit of change in management. And this is where things like hedge laying really comes in. Um, the structure score also uh, uses the, the, the 12 hedge structures that, that, we, that I showed you earlier. Um, and it looks for signs of structural damage, like having a hard knuckle um, of scar tissue um, at the trim line. So that's the theory. Um, how about in practice? So that's me surveying on a very soggy day. I'm still smiling. It's still quite fun, but I would suggest um, uh, maybe try surveying on a, on, a, on a nice sunny day instead. So top tips for surveying, I would say read the guidance notes before going out. So it's only about three or four A4 sides, um, maybe print them out and take them with you just in case there's um, questions that you didn't think of when you get out there. Um, I would say working in a group really helps, um, partly because, you know, um, you can you can you can help each other out. So sometimes, if I'm if I'm working with colleagues on this, you know, we'll both have completely different ideas about what percentage hawthorn it is and what percentage hazel it is, and we can either sort of battle it out until we we come to a conclusion, um, or or sometimes we sort of um, go for a compromise and go for a halfway house. Uh, but it also, you know, a second pair of eyes often helps spot species that you might not have seen yourself, um, and it sometimes just makes it more fun. I would say um, take a map of your area out and, and write on your map reference names or reference numbers for each hedge that you survey and then write that onto your survey form for the location. Because when you then add them to the website, on the website, all you're doing is dropping two pins on a map. Um, so actually, there's no point sort of um, faffing about with attitudes and longitudes. Um, if you've got a map with a reference, that will be much easier when it gets to sort of uh, put, putting this information online. I would say measure um, your paces so that you know what 30 metres is without having to take a tape measure uh, because tape measures get tangled and it's all really difficult in the field. Um, also take a stick. So I have a telescopic stick. Um, I think it was originally a telescopic paint roller for decorators, um, but I just marked some permanent marker on it um, every 10 centimetres or so, and that made it much easier to measure the hedge height um, and the base canopy, but also the width. The first time I went out hedge surveying, I tried to man it, measure the width of a hedge um, with a tape measure. Um, and you'll only try that once because you realize that it's completely impossible and impractical. Um, ID skills, well, there aren't a huge number of species, um, commonly woody species in hedges. So if you have a look at the, the, the second page of the survey form, that should show you what species you're likely to encounter. Um, and if you're happy ID IDing all of those, then you'll probably be fine. Um, but there are um, plenty of ID books. Um, the Woodland Trust do a couple of really nice hand pocket guides. 
Um, and of course, there are some ID apps as well. Um, the ID apps sometimes can get things a little bit wrong. I think for hedgerows, it's, it, they're, they're, they're fairly reasonable. Um, I just generally um, wouldn't use them for any sort of foraging or edible things, just in case. Um, and again, I'd say go for a nice day as well. I mean, I've surveyed in the rain and it's absolutely fine, but um, it's, it's nicer to do it in the, in the sunshine. So I have got a little bit of a video. It's not very long. Um, and this video shows roughly what it's like, just a flavor of what it's like to do each hedge survey. Um, just just as a, an idea. Here we go. So that should have given a bit of a flavour about doing um, one of the Great British Hedgerow surveys. Um, depending on what your objectives are, that one's a really good one to give um, more complete information. But if you're, if you're going to be looking at doing surveys for several hedges, I would say download the Healthy Hedgerows app um, because it gives management advice if that's the thing that you're after. Um, the website will also help, um, help you understand how to prioritise um, the different management. So we've got information about, you know, if all of your hedges are of a similar condition, we what you'd ideally want to be doing um, is getting your getting your hedges into a, a more of a cycle and a rotational cycle. Um, so it'll help you sort of prioritise which ones are the most important to rejuvenate, which ones can hang on a little bit longer. If you rejuvenate one, maybe leaving the other the the, the ones next to it to to um, with, without trimming for a couple of years, just to make sure that the, there's still forage for pollinators and birds and things. Um, so that will give plenty of advice on, on the website about how to sort of prioritize those sorts of decisions. Um, also on the website, 
is a bunch of photo gallery tutorials. So there's a, a different photo gallery for each of the categories of hedge. So the dense and managed, the over trimmed, the overstood, the recently rejuvenated. Um, and they really show you um, real life examples of what these hedges look like rather than just those sort of um, images that I showed. Um, yeah, how to recognize all those different stages really with a bit of information about how they got to how they are and, and sort of all those little telltale signs. Um, but there's also uh, there's also another um, gallery on there called Reading Hedges, and this is my favourite one. Um, and this is basically showing you how to read the history of a hedge um, a, a, and understand what management has seen in the past. Um, uh, understand all those little indicators that hedge shows us to let us know that it's time for a change in management um, and understanding all those little features of a hedge. So hopefully um, both, both of these surveys give enough information um, and, and collect enough information to, to help a brighter future for hedges. We, we want to see hedges bigger, better and more joined up. We want to see fulfilling their potential, which a lot of them aren't doing at the moment. So their potential economically, um, ecologically and environmentally. Um, and we definitely want to see them managed on a life cycle, including incremental increase um, and definitely including rejuvenation. So we want to see fewer gaps and definitely also more trees. Ah, there we are. I've come to the end of my slideshow. Um, but what I will do is, is just give it, um, uh, just a couple more words to, to surveying, if I may. Um, again, the old adage, what you don't measure, you can't improve. So measuring is always the first step in understanding what you need to do in the future to sort of make those hedges better, better and more valuable. Um, we've, we've gone a step further and, and given direct management advice out. Um, we've actually been really very lucky with, with both of these surveys that we've been very well supported by, by people that have been working in the hedgerow um, area for decades. Um, so a lot, of what, a lot of what we've done, we haven't reinvented the wheel at all. So we've taken the core of the DEFRA Hedgelink um, survey. I, I picture them all as cogs spinning separately. So there was the, the DEFRA um, uh, Hedgelink survey um, that we've sort of reappropriated. The, there was the, the hedgerow life cycle, um, and then there was the management coming in. And I just feel like all of these cogs were spinning separately. Um, and what we've done with these two surveys is we've used technology to just push them together and make a little bit of, of a machine. So not only does it collect data in for us, so we have like a national picture of hedgerow health, it gives information directly out about condition and about um, management advice. Um, and again, we haven't had to reinvent the wheel to do that. We've just pushed a few wheels together, um, which I think is quite neat because um, all of this is, is based on fairly sound research uh, and, and understanding that's been gathered together through Hedgelink and its members through, through the many years of, of that organization. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, I'm wondering if anybody's thinking this is going to be, you know, the, the Great British Hedgerow Survey might be a really great opportunity for your teams, your hedgehog friendly campus groups, maybe even student groups, societies, or taking on volunteers perhaps to get involved. And I'm thinking particularly for those campuses that have lots of hedgerows to survey. Um, I wonder if there's any questions on the survey method or mechanism or any of the um, things that Megan's mentioned in this second session from anyone on the on the group there. And um, feel free to unmute or use the chat box for those questions. I will say if you're doing it as part of a group activity um, on the website, you, you have to register to add the data, but we don't collect much detail, just I think your name and your email address and checking that you're over 18. Um, but what you can do when you're adding um, a hedgerow to, to, to the website is you can create a project. So you could call it, you know, whatever campus as, as the project. Um, and once that project has been created, several other people can add data and allocate it to that project. So all of that data gets collected together um, and whoever whoever it was that sort of created the, the project becomes the project admin and can see all of the data that gets allocated to that project, which means you can share the data without having actually share each other's email address and logons, which we, we don't really um, uh, uh, suggest. <laughs> That's, that's actually useful to know. That sounds like it's something that means that it could be done over a, a stage or period. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Quite yeah. I'm just think we've got some questions come in. Um, 
um from oh one from pam so a question about planting a hedgerow um alongside a deep ditch with um flowing water it's an old previous hedgerow from from old maps pam um is uh do you want to unmute um to ask your question sorry or yeah sure um certainly my students have oh they are doing hedgerow surveys so i've got my degree students doing a comparison between the defra the PTES, the two the two surveys you've mentioned already. Uh, so I'm looking forward to reading their assignments when they come in. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. Um, but also we've got this group um, which is doing the Hedgehog Friendly Campus, but under the umbrella of a, another group which was set up three years ago by students called BEAST. And BEAST is the, just to tell people what that is, Biodiversity, Environmental and Sustainability Team. And, we're, and that group is looking for projects. So the community nursery is one idea, but gapping up hedgerows is definitely another one with the um, resulting trees we grow, I hope. Um, and, and I've had, we've also had, Beast Group has also um, funded and raised money for and funded uh, dormouse nest boxes. So we're monitoring dormice and we've extended into an old ancient hedgerow alongside a path. So um, it would be good to connect up two or three woods we've got on site with a hedgerow. Mm -hmm. And that hedgerow would have to go along um, an existing ditch, which does have water in it most of the year. And, I, um, and it, there's also stock proof fencing either side of the ditch because we have horses. And so there's horses everywhere. Um, so is it possible, do you think, to plant a hedgerow along that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, um, loads of loads of hedgerows used to have ditches um, and ditches okay. actually add a really valuable element to the hedgerow. So you'll often get like a different set of plants um, growing at the hedge base if the hedge has got a ditch. So you'll get things like meadow sweet, depending on your soil type and area, of course. Um, yeah. But you'll often get sort of um, a, a new uh, complement of, of flowers that, that do prefer that sort of more damp environment. And that means you get a whole load different um, invertebrates as well. So a ditch really, really helps invertebrate life, which of course helps birds. So one of the, one of the reasons I think people attribute song, song thrush decline is actually that the, the, the um, field drainage is no longer mainly done by ditches and ditches used to have this sort of continually soggy environment where they'd always be able to find worms and snails and all sorts of invertebrates. Um, so ditches, I, I would say fantastic. They go hand in hand with hedges. Um, it does sound like you're going to have a bit of a logistical issue, perhaps planting yeah, yeah. and managing that hedge. Um, make sure it doesn't grow through the stock fencing, just because then management of that can become difficult. Yeah. Um, but I, it depends how far out the stock fencing goes and whether you have any wiggle room with that. Um, but with planting new hedges, I think there's a few considerations. I would say. Um, there's, there's two sort of main ways of establishing a good new hedge structure. Um, one is to sort of plant all of your whips, it tends to be sort of five or six whips per meter, double, double staggered line. Um, that's the sort of standard planting method. Um, and you can either, once they've, once they you know their roots have established, you can either start that incremental trimming then to create that structure. Um, or actually my preferred method is you just let that hedge grow for about seven or 10 years. So if you let it grow for about seven or 10 years, um, you can then take off those, those spiral tubes at the bottom. And what you'll find is you've got like a bare, a bare load of stem at the bottom of your hedge. Um, yeah. You'll have that even if you do the incremental trimming. So, it, and that's not ideal. Um, and then there's this thing, all the hedge terminologies are quite crude. So I'm sorry about this in advance, um, but it's called the maiden lay. Um, and it's and it's that you call uh, a hedge before it's been uh, laid is called a maiden, a bit like a, a tree as well. Um, and yeah. the first lay of a hedge is the one that really makes it robust. So I would say get it get it to ten years old, seven or ten years old, um, and then lay that hedge, and you will have more stems per meter than you planted. You will have a much thicker denser rob more robust hedge for it um it's a, a lot of people seem to think you know after 10 years you've got something that looks like a lovely blooming beautiful hedge um yeah. so people think it's a travesty to then say oh no no you need to chop it down and lay it um but you know it, it will have like uh, a bare patch at the bottom and and you know i think it's better without that so you will get a better hedge also 
laying a maiden hedge is so much easier than laying an overstood hedge. <laughs> so actually, if, yeah. if at any point you're looking at doing things like an introduction to hedge laying, um, any practical horses like that, sort of in the next sort of seven, 10 years of having planted, um, the maiden hedges are a really good place to start because they're, all the stems are roughly the same size, none of them are too thick, none of them have rot at the bottom, which can, you know, sometimes if you're laying an overstood hedge, you get most of the way through, and then you find that the bit that you need to bend is the only bit of the stem that's rotten, and it just sort of snaps off. Um, so yeah, you, you avoid all of those sorts of issues, and it's a really good introduction to sort of what hedge laying can do. Thank you very much, that's very helpful because Although I'm teaching these subjects, I'm not a practitioner of hedge laying. I know fully what it's all about and seen it, but that's been very helpful because I can identify in my head already some hedges that I think might be coming up to that suitable age. And I think one has been half laid by a previous member of staff and that's fine because it is quite tall and it looks like it's well established and it probably was probably was planted seven to ten years ago because we did belong to the countryside stewardship scheme for a oh, while yeah. so not for long five years but we did plant stuff at the time so I'm hopeful that we can maybe oh that sounds that sounds perfect then yep. it's actually I'm tomorrow I'm very excited tomorrow is the national hedge laying championships I'm oh. a complete geek for it it's it's down in Hampshire I don't know if any of you are close to Hampshire um but it's near Alton <laughs> Um, and I think they're, they're displaying 13 different types of hedge laying there, which is brilliant. Um, and there's like 90 competitors or something, and they're going to be um, each d demonstrating how well how well they can do their hedges. And it's, it's, a, it's a, I know it sounds very geeky, but it is a really great day out. Um, and it, it does show, you know, the different styles and, and, and what hedge laying can achieve. Um, and they will be the nation's best hedge layers there as well. So, you know, don't don't worry if your first attempt doesn't look like what they're doing at the competition. Mine, you know, I've been hedge laying since I was seven and mine still look tatty and rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't matter if they look a bit tatty. Um, you've also got things like the conservation style, which is sort of like um, it's hedge laying in that you're still cutting at the base down about 80 percent, bending it down. And but you're not doing the stakes and all the twiddly bits at the top um and again often really good between stock fencing um because it doesn't need to be immediately stock proof um in that, in that case um and, and that's generally what i tend to do so it doesn't look as glorious as those pictures that i showed uh but it it but it will always make a better hedge at the end of the day you will it, it takes yeah i i don't think i've ever seen anyone hedge lay so badly that the hedge is worse for it afterwards it's always better for it okay Thank you. Wonderful. Um, any any final questions? And I appreciate if we're a little bit over time. If anybody does need to dash, then that's absolutely fine. But if we do have questions, I know some of you hanging hanging on in the background looks like you're ready, ready and raring with a question. <laughs> if you want to unmute or pop in the chat box. I just want to say that's been a fantastic couple of hours spent. Really, really interesting with a lot of information. So thank you both very, very much for that. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's great to get the opportunity to chat hedge. <laughs> that was the, the main reason I turned my camera on as well, to be honest, to say thanks. So, uh, yeah, cheers. It was really, really useful. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Right. OK, so, Megan, if it's all right with you, um, if we do get any questions through afterwards, am I all right to pass them along? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. For them along. Lovely. Always happy to answer hedge questions. Oh, fabulous. And we've had quite a few links and um, online resources mentioned today, which I'll be following up on an email so that you've all got the information for. Um, thank you so much, Megan, for that, because that was absolutely fantastic. I'd heard part of that presentation before, but learned an awful lot more today than I, did, uh, I had done in the past. So unfortunately, I don't um, own any hedgerows, but I would love to go out there and start <laughs> surveying some just to see how um, how the process works. But yeah, um, if you keep us in the loop with anything new in the future that we can pass along to our teams, because they're obviously, as you can see, very dedicated and very interested in this sort of thing. Of course, so. yeah, of course, of course. I would say keep your eye out from anything from the tree council and more trees, because they've got a few exciting things in the in the pipeline.